morning, if you've got your Bibles with you today, would you turn with me to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, and in just a minute, uh, we'll be camping out in Galatians 2 verse 20 uh, for most of our message together this morning. It's a different message, uh, but Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20. I heard about a man who was always, always, always forgetting to tune his piano. Anybody have a piano at your house that is always out of tune can I see your hands yeah so this guy his piano he would always forget and uh, he would call the piano tuner and the piano tuner would come out and he would tune the piano and every single time he'd get on to this guy man don't don't wait so long don't wait uh, you know years if you will uh, to get it taken care of uh, let me come out here he just kind of gave him uh, the what for and uh, he'd done this to this guy several times and finally uh, the piano owner just had enough I mean this guy coming out and getting on to him every time uh, for failing to take so long to keep his piano in tune and so finally he got kind of defensive and he said you know what if you would send out a postcard reminder like my dentist would then I could call you for an appointment in a timely fashion well that piano tuner didn't even miss a beat he looked back at him he said well tell you what from now on when your dentist sends you a postcard call me I think there are certain things that it doesn't hurt us to be reminded of from time to time this over the last 20 years I, I've preached basically this message most every Memorial Day weekend. Uh, there was a time now coming out of COVID that I haven't uh, preached it like I did in years past. Uh, but I've preached this sermon. If you've been in Abilene, you've heard it several times before. Uh, if you're new at Abilene the last five years, you probably have never heard this message. It's a different message. But basically what I want to do this morning is I want to remind us of some very basic things that we already know. We, we already know of most, this is nothing going to be new, earth, uh, groundbreaking for you here this morning. But I do believe that there are things that we do need to be reminded of as Christians, especially in these fast-paced, crazy weeks of summer. My very first pastorate, my very first summer as a pastor, 1996. We were there at Gateway Baptist Church and outside of Memphis, Tennessee. It was a small little church. We had, what, 34, 36 people there the very first Sunday uh, that I was the pastor. And uh, we had no senior adults to help us. And so there was a senior adult lady by the name of Louise Vandergriff that came from First Baptist Brighton over to Gateway to help run the nursery, the preschool ministry. And I never will forget that very first summer, she handed me a, a, a little clipping that she had copied out of a periodical, a newspaper, a magazine decades before. And I read that little article and it so impacted me that years later I reached out to Miss Louise and I said, hey, will you make a copy of that? Will you send that so that I can have it uh, again to read and reflect upon uh, during the summer? And I'm going to share that with you here uh, this morning. The title is God Takes the Summer Off. And here's what it said. We are sorry to inform you that God will not be available during the summer beginning June the 1st. He feels he deserves some time off. So he has canceled his normal duties for the summer. He has agreed to, sp to send the sun and the rain occasionally when he happens to be in town. But so far as answering prayers for the needs of your family, please don't count on him. God has let church leaders know that they should not plan any outreach efforts or mission trips during the summer, or at least if they do, they will have to do it without him because he plans to be gone a lot to see relatives, baseball games, and the lake. God has expressed the opinion that we should find someone else to take his place. Then we reminded him of his promise, surely I will be with you always. But he said, he didn't realize when he said that, that that would mean going two or three years without a break. And so he expressed his sincere regret and hopes that it will not cause anyone any inconvenience. God may be contacted anytime after September the 1st, at which time he hopes to kind of get back into the routine. Please defer all requests until then, he requested. Aren't you glad that God doesn't take the summer off? As we approach summer, make it your determination to bring yourself and your family to God's house on Sunday, he'll be waiting for us to worship him. I read that my very first summer as a pastor. And so here's what I want to say to you this morning at the beginning of the summer of 2024. 
Number one, I want to thank you for your faithfulness. I want to thank you, thank you for being so faithful in attending and giving and serving. As we end the spring and as we enter into uh, the summer of 2024, I was so encouraged. I was so excited over the last couple of weeks as I have watched how you have invited your family and friends, how you have packed out our 250th anniversary, our parent-child dedication, our Mother's Day, and our graduate recognition services, how you have signed up to serve in Vacation Bible School, how you have given so faithfully and sacrificially to the ministry of this church and just in general how you have encouraged me as a pastor and our entire church staff. I want to thank you and I want to brag on you and I hope and I pray that you've been encouraged and edified as you have again have watched the Lord work in us and through us and around us and for us and I'll just say this and I'll move on. I really believe that God is doing something big at Abilene that he wants to do something supernatural uh, in and through the mission and ministry of Abilene Baptist Church. So you're there in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I've stalled as long as I can. Look down there. Let me show you what the Bible has to say about how you can spend your summer in the sun. Let me tell you why I want to do this. Here's real quickly. A little boy got one of those little toy lawnmowers for Christmas. How many of y'all have ever given one of your kids one of those little toy lawnmowers? Man, he loved to mow, but it was, it, was, it was the winter. You're not mowing in the middle of the winter. Even in Georgia, you're not mowing in the winter. And so all winter long, he mowed the carpet. He mowed the rug uh, in his parents' house. He just couldn't wait for summer to get here, for him to get his mower and out there and mow with his daddy. Well, summer showed up. And that day arrived when he could go out there and help his daddy. He took his mower outside. He didn't last two minutes. He came back in. He said, hey, it's too hot out there. I ain't mowing out there. I'm going to mow the carpet, right? <laughs> and I think that unlike mm, that little boy, most of us, when this time of the year, though, gets around, we want to get outside. We want to get out of town. We, we want to go to the mountains or the lake or the beach. We, we want to feel the sand between our toes. We want to hear the, the waves crash on the shore and smell and enjoy that cool ocean breeze. We want to sit in front of a beautiful mountain lake and not do a single thing all day long. We want to forget about everything, focus on nothing. You know why? Because it's, it's summer. Now, let me just surprise you all. I'm going to try to surprise you all a couple of times this morning. Let me just say this. I understand that, and I know that. But you know what else I know? A lot of times summer doesn't just mean that you take off from work or school or your other responsibilities. Unfortunately, and I've been a pastor long enough to know this, that there are a lot of people that see the summer as a time to take vacation from their responsibilities to their church and then from their walk with the Lord as well. Time alone with God has been replaced by time in the car with the kids. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Uh, are we there yet? Uh, worship has been replaced by whatever. The prayer time has been replaced by playtime. Tithes and offerings uh, are now used to pay for the gas, the hotel, and the all-you-can-eat buffet. And they don't have time to witness because they're too busy water skiing and wakeboarding. And here's the thing. Those things in and of themselves, nothing wrong with them. I love going to the beach. Matter of fact, you know, we got a new campus uh, out in Harlem. If we could find a church around Pauly's Island, we could start Abilene Beach Campus. Can I get an amen? Hey, can I have a motion? We do that all right. So, but we would do that. I love it. Man, I love the beach. I'm a beach bum now. I never thought I'd be a beach bum, but I'm a beach bum. I love going to the beach. I love going to the mountains. I love taking those long road trips. I love water skiing and even wiping out on a kneeboard. But do you want to know what you will have done if you spend your summer doing all of those things? You will have wasted it. So here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that God is the one who gives us the seasons. The psalmist said in Psalm 74, verse 17, it was you who set all the boundaries of the earth. You made both summer and winter. And so God made the summer not just for our enjoyment. He made it for our enrichment. And I believe that God wants us to spend all of the seasons, including summer, living and walking and working and enjoying the sun, S-O-N. So again, you're there in Galatians 2, verse 20. Let me quote for you what Paul wrote. It's a great verse, one you ought to commit to memory, and you ought to let this guide you and govern your life especially this summer. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, there, there's so much going on here. We don't have time to get into all of this, but but if I were to just take this verse and unpack it for you, do a little digging for you this morning, theologically and scripturally, here's what I'd say. 
You ought to spend the summer dying to self. That's what Paul said. He said, I must decrease, he must increase. You ought to spend this summer walking in the Spirit, he said, living by faith in the Son of God. And you ought to spend this summer loving the Savior, loving him because he first loved us. That's what I would tell you if I had time to tell you this morning. That, that's the theological lesson for today. But here's what I understand. Most everybody here this morning, even though you're, by the way, you're here on Memorial Day weekend. Will you look at your neighbor and say, I'm so proud of you. Look at your neighbor and say, man, I'm so proud of you. Man, I'm so proud of you. You're here on Memorial Day weekend. You're not like those backsliders that have already started out. I mean, Memorial, gone, already gone, right? You're here. But here's what I know. Here's what I know. Most everybody's already in summer mode, Right? Most, so if, if I try to put too much on you this morning, if I try to give you something a little bit too heavy, here's what you're going to do. You're going to drop it right after you walk outside that door. I mean, you're, you're, you're going to, you're, you're already, so this time of year in church is kind of like a senior in high school after Christmas. You, you can't do anything with a senior in high school after Christmas. Why? Because they have senioritis. And there are a lot of people who come to church even here this morning, and, and you've got summeritis. And so let me be very simple, very practical for you here this morning in this message. Let me give you four little simple statements. Jot these down somewhere there in the margin of your Bible. If you've been around here for any time at all, you probably got these somewhere. But write these down there in the margin of your Bible to help you know how to spend your summer in the sun. Number, number one, this summer I want to encourage you to give Jesus your attention. I want to encourage you to give Jesus your attention. What I mean by that is I want you to give him the first hour of every day. So I'm going to keep going back to our verse this morning because it's so important. Notice what Paul said again. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Now catch what he said. If you're a Christian, if you're a believer, if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible says that right now, right this very moment, this very second, Jesus Christ lives in you. Now, if Christ lives in you, then don't you think that he wants you to live the way that he lived? Don't you think that he would want you to do what he did when he was here upon this earth? You say, well, yes, of course. Well, here's what I need you to say, understand. If Jesus is living inside of you, then as a result of that inward relationship, there ought to be in that outward reality of the Christ life in your life. If Jesus is living inside of you, then it ought to show up on the outside. You say, well, Pastor, what does that mean? It means that the pattern of Jesus' life ought to be the pattern of your life. Well, Pastor, that sounds great, but again, I'm not catching it. It means that what was important to Jesus is important to you. So the question is what was important to Jesus. Well, for one thing, there's prayer and time alone with the Father. It's one of the primary marks of the personal life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Prayer and time alone with God. Over and over and over again in the pages of the, of the New Testament and the Gospels, we read about the personal prayer life of Jesus. And by the way, by here, I love preaching. Man, I have two earned doctorates in preaching. I love preaching. But you know what you will never find? You never find where the disciples went to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us how to preach. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. Why? Because it was the primary mark of the personal life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you're never going to, you should never minimize this summer what Jesus emphasized. So buckle your pew belt because this might sting just a little bit. Have you read the Gospel of Mark? Have, have you noticed what Mark said about Jesus? It, it kind of hurts me to even read this verse. I told the, the West Campus this morning, liberals cut the wrong parts out of the Bible. Liberals cut out Jonah and the whale and, and, and the bodily resurrection of Jesus. If they're gonna, they, I would have cut out this verse, all right? If I was a liberal, I would cut out this verse. Mark 1, verse 35. Listen to what it says. Now in the morning... Having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Did you catch what Mark said? Mark said that Jesus got up early before the chickens, before the sun got... How many, any morning people here this morning? Can I see your hands? How many of y'all morning people here this morning? Raise your hands. You, 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 you can always tell a morning person, well, I was up early this morning with God today. <laughs> right? And I always want to say, yeah, I was up till 2. Anyway, Jesus got up early. 
And before it was even daylight, he went out and he got by himself and he spent time in prayer. And so here's the thing I want to tell you this morning. The way to get the most out of your summer is take advantage of these long summer days. Get up early. Spend time with Jesus. Spend time in prayer. Spend time reading your Bible. Get into the Word. Get the Word into you. Talk to Jesus. Let Jesus talk to you. Spend this summer in the sun by spending this time this summer with the sun. You say, Pastor, what do I need to do? Well, with all the traveling and vacationing, it's easy. People sleeping in, it's easy to neglect your, your quiet time with God. So you don't want to do that. And there, we have those relationships, all of us do, where you can go a month or two months or a year, and the, the minute you're back with that friend, you're, you're picking up right where you left off. It kind of doesn't work that way in the spiritual life. If you miss time with the Lord, if you miss six weeks this summer or 12 weeks or, or even just one week, it's going to hurt and hinder you in your walk with the Lord. But I'm telling you that if you will give Jesus the first hour of every day, you say, Pastor, why the first hour? Well, duh, you're going to get busy and forget about it. That's why you give him the first hour out of every day so that you don't miss it. But if you will give Jesus the first hour of every day, if you will get alone in some quiet place where nobody else can bother you, and if you will spend time in prayer and time reading your Bible, spend time talking to Jesus and letting him talk to you, I'm telling you by the time the summer end comes, you're going to have the marks of Jesus all over you. You're going to have a suntan. Y'all a little faster than the other ones, right? <laughs> Man, first service, they just sat there like, what? But I'm just telling you this morning, number one, as you begin the summer, I want to encourage you to give Jesus your attention the first hour of every day. Number two, give Jesus your devotion the first day out of every week. So go back to our main verse for today, Galatians 2, verse 20. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh. Let me stop right there for a second. It's not exactly what he's talking about, but that is the way that most people live their lives. In the flesh, and, and not just in the summer. They live in the flesh, in, in their body, doing what they want to do, when they want to do it, how they want to do it, where, all those sorts of things. Now, I'm going to say something that if you're newer to Abilene, this, this might surprise you, but I've said it before. Take your vacation. I thought I'd get more response than that. <laughs> Take your vacation. Take some time to rest and reflect and relax. Take, take your vacation. Now, I don't know how you're going to do it. Have you checked gas prices lately? I mean, I don't know how you're going to do it. How, how are you going to gas and food and lodging and all those sorts of things? If you go to Disney now, if you've got four kids, you'll have to sell one in order for the other three to go. <laughs> That's how expensive things have, things have gotten. So I just want to know, for people who, we got people here at Abilene, you're going to take four, five, six vacations. And I'm going, how do you do that? Somebody says, easy, credit cards. That makes a whole lot of sense. Spend 10 years paying off one week of vacation, right? No, no. But take your vacation. Go rest, relax, rejuvenate. I'm, I'm telling you, I mean it. I don't think that there's anything wrong and there's a whole lot right <laughs> We're taking some time to get away, letting your hair down, and just vacation. As a matter of fact, Kim and I are going to take some time to take the kids away uh, this summer. I'll just take it a, a step further. I do believe that I would be sinning against my family not to take a few weeks every single year to just unplug, to get away. And what goes for my family goes for your family too. But can I ask you this one question? Can, can you explain? So I, I get it. If you're new this morning, I'm from Tennessee. You can probably tell that from my accent. And uh, being from Tennessee, I've got to take off my shoes and socks to count above 10. So I, I need some help understanding this, right? But can you guys explain to me, because I've watched this now for nearly 30 years. Can you explain to me why in the world it takes a month or more for some people to get ready, get packed, get out of town, and then recuperate from a one-week vacation? Can anybody explain that to me? I never have understood that, right? I mean, it's like you need a vacation after your vacation. But, but I'm just telling you, that there are some people we say goodbye to in May and good to see you again at the end of August, right? It's crazy. But when you're out of town, let me encourage you. 
enjoy your vacation. And I would encourage you on this too. Be in church. I've said this now for over a decade. When you go out of town on vacation, I want you to go to church somewhere. You say, why? Well, first of all, you all be in church. Number two, if you'll go some of the other churches, you might just realize how good we have it around here, right? Every single year, I'll tell somebody to do that, and they'll come back after vacation, and they'll go, Preacher, we went to vacation up in the mountains, and we went to this, this church down there at the beach. Pastor, I've never been so glad to get back in my spot at Abilene in all my life. But here's be, just be faithful. When you're in town, be in church. When you're out of town, be at church too. You know what David, David, the Bible says, was a man after God's own heart? And David said this. How foreign this attitude is to, to some people. He said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Did you catch that? David wasn't trying to get out of going. David was trying to get in the place, right? Well, but about pastor, pastor. You know, pastor, we've got the family vacation down at the beach, and then we've got the 4th of July trip uh, to the lake, and, and then there's the annual camping trip that takes place the third week of August. And Oh, yeah, we, we've got the family yard day the second week of June, and, and we, we, we're taking the doggy on a doggy vacation uh, this summer. He gets so tired chasing that ball and digging up the neighbor's flowers. And, and then, of course, there's, we always got to go see the outlaws and the in-laws sometime during the summer. And, you know, pastor, everybody needs a, a Sunday or so to get over a trip. Hey, pastor, we'll see you when school starts back. No, David didn't have that idea. Are y'all still there this morning? Amen. Some of y'all went, I came to church on Memorial Day not to hear this. Well, buckle up, baby. So here's what I need you to understand. David wasn't trying to get out of going to church. He was doing everything he could to get into worship. Let me give you a really practical, a really practical reason. You don't want to miss. I mean, take your vacation, take your vacation. You don't want to miss too much this summer at Abilene. You know why? Because when you get back, somebody will be sitting in your seat. It happens, right? If you miss two months or two and a half months, I mean, you're here this morning, man, I'm just so proud of you, not like those backsliders that aren't here. But if you miss June and July and most of August, when you come back, here's what's going to happen. We always grow during the summer. I don't know why that is, but it always, June is our biggest attendance month almost of the entire year. We grow so much during the summer. And if you miss June and July and you come back toward the middle of the end of August, here's what's going to happen. Somebody you've never seen before is going to open the doors for you, welcome you to Abilene, hand you a flyer, you're going to get in here and somebody you've never set eyes on before is going to be sitting in your seat. <laughs> Am I lying? Nope. It's funny. <laughs> it's 11 o'clock, i got time. It's funny to watch it about the second week of August and somebody who's missed all summer long and they come in and they go to their spot and and it's this dumbfounded look on their face because there's somebody sitting there. And, and you know what, Abilene, you're not allowed to say, that's my seat. Some of y'all do. We're going to have to have a talk about that. <laughs> but if you miss the summer, you're going to come back in. So Kim and I, we started a church in Ohio in 2000. And there was a family called the Wheelers that helped us get started. A sweet family. And uh, he was at the very first meeting uh, gave a large gift to help get the church started. We, we started off having Bible study in their living room. Uh, we got a trailer that all the church went into, and we would unpack it every Sunday morning. I mean, the folks out at West have no idea. We would pack this 7 by 16 tandem axle trailer up with all the church, back up to the doors at 8 o'clock, hold, hold church at 1030, and by about 1230, it's already back in the trailer and headed back toward the church. That first day we had that trailer, Neil showed up, and he showed us how to pack that trailer. But then about this time of the year, about Memorial Day, he came to me and he said, Hey, now, preacher, we're going to miss a couple of weeks this summer. The girls are on a competitive soccer teams, and so we're going to miss a, a couple of Sundays. No, uh-uh. All of June, all of July, all of August. They showed back up. They showed back up that first week after school started back. And I'm glad some, nobody's sitting right here because I'd have to point at somebody. They sat right there. And it was all over them. A body language. I mean, the expression on their face. Their body, they had everything crossed. I mean, they had everything crossed they could cross. Not happy. Every one of them, not happy. 
It didn't take two days. I got an email. I kept that email. I go back and read it from time to time. <laughs> and here's basically what the email said. Dear Pastor Brad, we're having a hard time connecting at the church. Our girls don't feel like they're being accepted. My wife doesn't feel a part of what's going on. Guess what? They weren't. We had only been up and running, what, six months? We launched on Easter. This is the end of summer. We've been up and running six months. They had missed three months. They've been gone for three they weren't a part of it. So I'm just saying to you this this morning because I see you're really excited. This summer, make worship a priority in your life. Make sure that on Sunday morning you're worshiping together with your church family. You say, well, Pastor, I can worship just as good by myself. I can worship just as good with my family in a hotel room. Look right here. You may be able to worship God there because God's everywhere, but you cannot worship in those places like you can in here with your church family. Gather together around the Word of God for encouragement, for edification, for instruction, and for praise. That's why the writer of Hebrews keeps repeating this little phrase, let us, let us, let us, let us hold fast our confession. Let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace. Let us consider one another in order to stir up to love and to good works. How do we do that? The next verse, verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, there are legitimate times to be out of town. I'm going to miss a couple of Sundays. But let me just encourage you in this. Find a good Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church in that town where you're vacationing so that you and your family can worship the Lord. Amen. Don't miss this. I don't want, as a daddy, daddies look right here. I don't want as a father for my kids to get the idea that a vacation from work is a vacation from worship. Give Jesus, this summer, give Jesus your affection. Give Jesus your uh, devotion. Give Jesus your attention. Number three, give Jesus, like I said a moment ago, I want you to give Jesus your affection. The first time out of every dollar. One of my favorite verses in the Old Testament is found in Chronicles, where the Lord says, where the Bible says there, Moreover, because I have set my affection on the house of my God, I have given to the house of my God. I'm talking here, of course, about our financial stewardship, giving of our tithes and offerings. What's a tithe? Well, the tithe is the first dime out of every dollar, the first dollar out of every ten, the first ten out of every hundred, and so on. So if you go back to our verse here this morning, watch this. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. There's a statement for us on giving. Today we are living by faith. We are to live and give by faith. So have y'all noticed how expensive things have gotten now? The other day around the house, we let our kids do chores and earn money. And um, it was funny yesterday, we had a tree get knocked down the storm the other day. And so my kids kept going, hey, how much are you going to pay me to help with the tree? I said, nothing, you live here. <laughs> I pay you every day, food, clothing, house. So no. But a week ago, I think it was John, John did some work and I promised, hey, if you'll do this, I'll give you $10. And so he came in and he said, hey, I, I want to I get a new Oculus game. And uh, I said, how much is it? He said, $10. I said, no more? No, sir. No more than $10. It's $10. I said, no more. You only earned $10. You didn't earn $10 plus. All you earned was $10. You're not getting them. No, sir. I'm telling you, I promise, Daddy, it's only $10. So he bought the game. The next morning, I'm checking my bank account, $10.76. I called him downstairs and said, John, I thought you said this was $10. It was. No, it's not. It's $10.76. Said, he said, I don't understand. It said it was $9.99. He said, where was that other money? I said, taxes. He said, what's that? <laughs> and I said, tax is what you pay the government for letting you live here. He said, who's in charge? I said, the president. <laughs> oh, Oh, my goodness. Some of you guys are going to be so proud. Some of y'all are going to be mortified. That boy watches too much Fox News. Because right there in my bedroom, he had a come apart. I mean, again, mad. 
upset. How to pay. Joe Biden is not on his Christmas list, I guess, all right? And not at all. But we're living in an economy where you have to live and you have to give by faith. You ever heard that deep theological, that deep philosophical question? If a tree falls in the forest and nobody's there to hear it, does it make a sound? You ever heard that? Well, the answer, of course, is yes. But there's another philosophical, theological question that I want to ask and answer this morning. Here it is. If a church member goes on vacation or you're out of town or just decides to stay home in bed and worship at Bedside Baptist or St. Mattress <laughs> and watch Joel or Charles on TV, does the ministry of this church still stay open and going while they're not here? What's the answer? Yes. Yeah. How does that happen? through the tithes and the offerings that you and I give to and through this church. But here's the thing. A lot of times people take their tithes with them when they go on vacation. In some way, somehow, for some reason, the tithes get lost on vacation and never seem to make it back to town. I mean, think about this. If you lost one of your kids on vacation, most of you, I'm sure, would go back and find them and bring them home, right? I, I said that. I said that at West. I said, most of you all would go back and get your kids. They're sleeping on the front row going. <laughs> Man, that kid's going to need a lot of therapy, right? <laughs> but most of us are going to go back and, and get their, their kid. This summer, make sure that you do the same with your tithe. Or better yet, leave it before you go. And here's the point. Be faithful. Be faithful in your prayer life. Be faithful in your church attendance. Be faithful in your support of the ministry of this church that takes care of you and your family. All these other groups that we give to, Samaritan's Purse, Salvation Army, they're great groups. Nothing wrong with them. But not even they have the track record that this church has had for over 250 years of ministering to the spiritual and physical needs of this city. And one of the ways that you can do it is just take care of just being consistent and systematic in your giving. Again, just make it easy. Let's say you want to give, you're supposed to give $5,200 a year. Hey, that's $100 a week. Maybe you want to give $6,000. By the way, most of us need to give more than that. But say you're going to give $6,000, that's $500 a month. But if you will do as my family does, it makes it real easy to keep your giving at biblical levels even when you're out of town. And these days, we got automated drafts. we got giving online and, and all those sorts of things. It makes it very easy to be faithful in my stewardship even during the summer. Here's the last thing. Give Jesus your adoration. That's the first love of your heart. Galatians 2 verse 21 last time. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me.